I'm Renny McBride. I am the branch manager at the Wright City branch, and we have Liz from the Master Gardeners at the University of Missouri Extension Office here. She's going to talk to us about native plants of Missouri as part of our bicentennial celebrations. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome Liz, and if you all have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments box, and we'll cover them at the end. And I'm going to pass, pass the uh, camera over to Liz. I thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm very interested in native plants. It came about because I moved down to Jefferson County about 25 years ago. And I had come from St. Louis County and uh, it was all lawns and we didn't see many native plants. Uh, here are just a few that I had taken. Um, there's a couple different milkweeds and uh, landsleaf coreopsis and cardinal flower. This is part of the reason I absolutely love uh, propagating native plants. In our nursery, we had I collect the seeds and we had uh, planted these and had quite a few milkweeds and I went out one day and I was wondering why leaves were stripped off and here were all the monarchs. And it's a wonderful sight to see when, when they're coming through and uh, hopefully laying eggs on the bottom of these leaves. The importance of native plants um, is very important. It helps the native pollinators, uh, the bees, moths, butterflies, and flies. The native bees are endangered. Um, so it's uh, really important that we plant these. And something to keep in mind, because it does bring in the native pollinators, it's a very good idea to plant native plants either actually in your vegetable gardens or around them, because that will bring in more of the pollinators. Um, it's helping the birds because the baby birds' critical food is caterpillars. You know, they don't eat the seed we put out or anything like that. Mom and dad go and, and get the caterpillars off the various trees and plants, and then that's what they feed them. Uh, native berries and leaves are always attractive to the um, wildlife. You can also use some of these for medicinal and culinary uses. That's a whole nother uh, talk about how you can use those, and it's also best to use native plants and not cultivated natives. Those are called nativars, and they're often too genetically removed from the actual native plants. And these would be the plants that were not introduced. They were the plants that were here 200 years ago and um, more. And um, it's very important to use that because some of our native bees and things can't use like the bright frilly um, cone flowers that we see. Um, we actually have quite a few natives and you can get some color by using different ones of those. When you plant a native garden, um, native garden can come under scrutiny from uneducated neighbors. This is really important if you are in a subdivision or something like that. Um, you want to make sure that the garden looks intentional so it doesn't just look like a big plot of weeds. Keep your garden well tended. You might create a habitat garden and even have a little sign out there saying a butterfly garden or something so they can realize uh, what you're doing. Another choice is to integrate your native plants with non-native traditional landscape plants. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that later. And you might wanna do that in your front yard versus in your backyard, you could go a little crazy with your, your native plants. Plants growing together in the wild will give you a hint as to what you should plant together and where to plant them. So this is a perfect time, well, probably wait another couple of weeks to take a good walk in the woods slow and look down because we have quite a few spring ephemerals that will be coming up. And a lot of times they're only up a couple of inches. So they're, you can't just go whizzing by. Um, when you plan this native garden, you wanna create structure again. So people 
know that this is intentional, what you're doing. So you might do a wall or a berm. You can have a stepping stone path going through it. You could have a fence um, and trellis where maybe some of our um, native vines would be growing on them. Always try to plant in drifts, like in groups of three, five, or seven. And I know that's often a hit to the pocketbook. So um, I would say if you can get three and then you can learn how to save the seeds and propagate your own plants to help it spread throughout your garden. Define your edges and curved shapes, adding only a few straight lines. It just looks much more graceful. And mulching will make the plantings appear neater. And again, very intentional. There's a large variety of plants depending upon your site conditions. So you have to think about sun or shade, um, moist or dry, rocky or not well draining, um, things like that. You can consider the types of roots of some of these plants. Some have very long tap roots that go way down and that would be something like most of the milkweeds. You have some that have fibrous roots and that's good if you have something that is maybe washing out for you and you want to stop the erosion. Then if you plant some of these native plants with fibrous roots, they will hold your ground. Um, <clears throat> some of them have rhizomes and corms. Um, those would be things like the um, uh, uh, the Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, you would have some um, native iris that I will be showing you that have rhizomes and things like that. Don't plant a single species. Um, bees often specialize in a certain type of flower and not other ones. So a single plant is not sufficient for them. You have to have a grouping of several. Oh, okay. I volunteer a lot at a place called Crest Farm Garden Preserve, and it is for my master gardening hours and stuff. It's a garden preserve just north of Hillsboro, and our mission statement is to uh, improve wildlife habitat and to teach gardening uh, techniques and things like that. We wanted to create, since I was growing these native plants, we wanted to create a native uh, plant garden that could act as a demonstration and also um, where I could collect the seeds from something fairly close instead of tromping out in the fields, which is what I usually do. So as you can see, we were putting in stepping stones so that we had a path. We had a couple neat looking rocks that, that they moved in there. And off to the left, you'll kind of see what we're doing I wanted to have an area where we could have some uh, plants that love moisture. Well, since the rest of it is very rocky and more glady like we get in Jeff County, what we did is we um, dug out um, a great big dip and then lined it with um, plastic and then put the soil back in. And one of our very clever people took the downspout from the building that's there and um, ran hose from that. And that, every time it rained then, that would keep that area boggy and moist. So when you're working with your own, own property, you can kind of figure out where you have maybe a wet area that the, you know, the rain always seems to wind up in one area and you can't really, there are certain things you just can't grow there. You can't grow grass. Well, there are quite a few natives that, uh, that like moisture. Here's where I was talking about planting natives amongst ornamentals. This happens to be the front of my house. And- Liz, I hate so, to interrupt you, but I think you possibly didn't get your screen shared. Oh, you're kidding. Hmm. Okay, let me see where I can go back to that. Okay, so if I hit this again, no. Okay. 
how could I be off this now? No. Mm -hmm. is, that, is there a little share screen icon at the bottom of your? That's what I'm looking at and I can't seem to find it. I'm sure it's there somewhere. Um, you move the mouse up towards the, like the picture on the screen. You should, that whole menu should pop up. Well, it was working before. So now, let me see if I can get back to, oh. oh there it is, share screen now. If I can get the right one up. Hmm. Okay. So I'm screen sharing, can you see it now? Yes, I think you'll want to start the um, slideshow, which is that little um, icon up at the top there. Okay, slideshow. Yep, and then you see one that says from beginning, I think maybe, or? From beginning, okay. So let me go through this pretty quickly, if you can see this now. Um, as I mentioned, these are some of uh, different types of milkweeds. There's a lanceleaf coreopsis is the yellow one and cardinal flower is this bright red. And that's one that likes moisture. This is where I was talking about um, the importance of, of raising natives because then we had um, quite a few monarchs that we're enjoying our nursery where we had all of those. Um, the importance of native plants, it helps you native pollinators. Uh, the native bees are endangered, so we want to provide as much habitat for them as we can. In particular, um, caterpillars, native caterpillars that will be eating your native plants, it's not a bad thing. Uh, they are baby birds critical food source because that's protein for them. Obviously the baby birds don't need our seed we put out. And so mom and dad go to, especially like oak trees, there are many, many different caterpillars on there. So they will be grabbing those from our native oaks. Uh, wildlife loves our native berries and leaves when you're planting bushes. There are medicinal and culinary uses, which <clears throat> is kind of a whole nother um, lengthy talk. Uh, it's best to use the native plants and not the cultivated nativars is what they're called because they're often too genetically removed. Um, a native garden can come under scrutiny from your um, uneducated neighbors who don't know about native plants and why it's important to plant them. So it's important to show that your garden looks intentional. Keep it well tended. You might create a habitat garden and have little signs out saying this is a butterfly garden or whatever. Um, if you label your plants, then that's also an educational thing. And it shows that you planted that there for a purpose and it's not just a weed. Uh, another choice is to integrate the native plants with the non-natives. And <clears throat> when you are out taking a hike or walking, you can get an idea of what plants to plant together and where to plant them. So if you're taking a hike or something, you might see that <clears throat> these two particular uh, types of plants grow in the same area. That would tell you that would be a good idea to plant those near each other in your garden. Uh, let's see, it's important to create structure. Again, it will look intentional if you have a wall, a berm, a path, <clears throat> a fence, fence and trellis. You can have some of our native vines, which are really, really nice. I'll have a, a short list of those later on. Plant and drifts of groups of three, five, or seven. <clears throat> have curved edges versus straight lines. Um, when you're having a native garden, it's not quite as formal. So you, you, a curved shape just makes it much softer. 
um, mulching will also make the plantings appear neater, cleaner, and intentional. There's a lot of variety of plants depending on your soil condition. Again, I mentioned that the tap roots, uh, quite a few of the prairie plants have very long single tap roots. Other types have a fibrous root, and those are good to plant where you have um, uh, some erosion. Uh, we have some that have rhizomes and corms, and they might be jack in the pulpit, uh, some crusted dwarf crusted iris that I'll talk about. Um, don't plant a single species. You want to plant quite a few. And bees often specialize in a type of flower and they won't go to other ones. So a single plant is not sufficient for one. Uh, this was the native garden that we planted where I volunteer at Crest Farm Garden Preserve. And this was, so we have a demonstration garden to show people how you can use native plants and also to uh, make it easier for me to collect seeds, which is how I propagate the plants. I wanted a wet area because, um, for instance, cardinal flower and blue lobelia like the moisture. So we dug out an area, lined it with plastic, put the soil back in, and then one of our very clever guys hooked up this hose to our downspout on the building. And so it, um, the water will flow there and it will keep that moist. Which is very good in August. Uh, this is the front of my house. So you're planting natives amongst ornamentals. For instance, I have a couple of Euonymus plants there in the back. Um, and I have Japanese painted ferns, which are not native, but amongst those are the tall, pure green ostrich ferns. And you might be able to tell against the, the brick wall on the right, there's a, you can see a little uh, square there. And the ferns really like it there because that's my dryer vent. So it has warmth and it has moisture um, throughout the year. So they do very well. This is another area of my garden. And you can see I have um, non-native iris. I have non-native hostas. But again, um, there are some trillium that are just now coming up there. I also have some uh, Virginia bluebells in there. So you can plant some natives amongst the, the others. Solentine poppy is also showing there. I'll show you a close up. Shade plants normally do not have a, uh, a tap root. They usually have um, a fibrous root or rhizomes. Once you get those established, what's nice is they will spread, some a little slower than others, but then you can dig them up and move them to another, dig up part of it and move it to another part of your garden. Um, Celandine poppy is one that will spread um, quite well because it has a seed pod that when it is ripe, it busts open and the seeds fly all over. So that's, a, that's one that will um, propagate very easily on its own. Virginia bluebells, Jack in the pulpit, wild ginger is good in the shade. Um, so it's very good for ground cover under trees because it's so hard you really can't do anything with grass under trees. So wild ginger is very good at, with that. The ostrich ferns, as I had said, were the uh, tall. Mine will get greater than 36 inches tall. There's also Salomon seal. There's the native columbine that's the yellow and red that you've probably seen when you're out in the country. Ohio sp spiderwort is another one. It's a very pretty blue. This is a picture of bellwort. Um, it grows in the forests, um, in woodland. It is not yet blooming when I've, when I've been hiking. It has, is not yet blooming, but it should be in the next couple of weeks. And it actually hangs down on the right. You can kind of see the, the yellow. It's actually hanging down like a bell. These are the Virginia bluebells. Um, I love those. I love having them in my garden near our house 
because that tells me um, that spring is here. And uh, when we're going through the cold, damp, really great days like today, it's nice to look out there. And my bluebells are maybe an inch tall right now. This is bloodroot. This is an interesting, uh, it has such an interesting leaf, which is why I like it. And again, you can see all the leaf litter. This will be uh, out in the woods um, about this time. I've already had mine blooming in my garden. On the left is Spring Beauty. That's one of the earliest ones to, to be showing. Um, and Ruinimini is on the right. These are very, very short. So when you are hiking, you have to really be looking at around your feet and, and off the path because they're very, very short. They're not gonna stand out um, for you. And these are spring ephemerals. So they will only bloom for a short time and then they will die back. They are perennials, they'll be back next spring, um, but they do die back in the, uh, in the summer and it kind of makes sense because these like shade, uh, they like the cool. Um, once the forest really starts leafing up, then they wouldn't be getting enough light to, to bloom. Wild Sweet William is on the left. That's a, a phlox, um, a native phlox. And Golden Seal is on the right. That one is kind of um, difficult to find. I've, I've seen it in our woods at home only a couple times and I've been there 25 years. So this is Wake Robin Artrillium. And there are many different kinds. Some are white, some are more maroon. Um, I love these. For some reason, I always loved them as a kid. And so um, I have some now. Mine that I have in my garden have darker speckles on the leaves. Um, this is a wild hyacinth. Um, I don't see them very often, um, but again, it will come as a, as a bulb. If you buy these, um, when you go to transplant it, you'll see that there's actually a bulb there. This is the celandine poppy. And as I said, um, this will bloom a, a fair amount of time if you keep it well watered. It does need the, the moisture to keep it cool. Um, as our summer is heating up in those kind of funny oval whitish pods there, those that's where the seeds are developing and that will just pop open and the seeds will, will go. Um, and so I like that because then I dig them up and I move them to someplace else in my garden. This is an absolute favorite of mine. This is called a copper iris and um, it is truly a copper color. Here it looks a little pinky or a little reddish, but it's, it's definitely a copper and that's a favorite. Um, it will take sun, part shade, um, and it is average to moist soil, 12 to 14 inches high and it'll bloom in April and May. My, uh, my leaves are coming up, but I'm not getting any stalks or anything yet. It's still too early. This is dwarf crested iris. This one is very short and I like it. Um, I use it on the front border of my, my uh, beds because it doesn't get in your way. It's not flopping over where you're having to trim it so you can walk on your walkways. Um, and this is just, it's just a sweet little plant and um, it takes average to dry soil and it will bloom in April and May. This is the spider wart I was talking about. That's a very pretty um, blue flower and I like it. There's an um, Ohio spider wart. Um, I think there are a couple other kinds, um, but we do have uh, this one that's native to Missouri. This is Indian pink, which is also, it will take some sun, some shade, and it will take some um, dry to moist, uh, soil, so it's it's a little forgiving in that, but it does, and it blooms a long time. It will bloom from May through um, August or September, and I love it. It's a very unusual looking plant, and it 
always catches everybody's eye when they see it in your garden. This is the wild ginger that I was saying. This is very good um, as a cover, as a uh, ground cover underneath trees. It's slow to develop, but then it lives. It lives a fairly long time, and uh, it, you just have to be patient with its spreading. And in April and June, it will have a maroon colored flower right at the soil line. It's kind of you have to get down there and kind of lift a leaf to see it. So some of the sun perennials that you might want to consider. Um, this one would probably be a little hard to find. Um, I'm fortunate where I live. Um, this is just growing naturally and it's called Hori Pacoon. It's a very strange name. I love it because it's not, it's not orange and it's not yellow. It's this beautiful like almost gold color and orangey yellow. And so it's a favorite of mine. Missouri Evening Primrose, I'm sure some of you have seen that. It's real good if you've got really cruddy, rocky soil, like if you had um, construction work done or something where you got rocks and all kinds of stuff in it. Um, this is very good. It blooms just one, each flower only lasts one day, but on the right, you can kind of see under that flower, there's a, a bud starting up. Um, and so they're pretty, they will bloom quite some time. This is Bush's, Bush's Poppy Mallow, and it's good for a real bright magenta pink. Um, I, I like it. Um, this one is more upright. There's another purple Poppy Mallow that uh, sprawls a bit more, and I like this one because this is upright. This is one that um, you probably would not see unless you're in Jeff County or some of the other areas of the state that have glades because it loves really miserable uh, soil and needs to be well drained and all that. And it's actually in the Clematis family, which is kind of interesting. Purple Beard's Tongue, I love this. This is very showy, those blooms are very large. It really adds some pop to your garden, especially if you have it next to like the um, landsleep coreopsis that's yellow um, and the hummingbirds and other, um, mainly the hummingbirds because they have the long beak to go down in that throat. Um, but it's, it's really a stunner. This is the much smaller foxglove beard tongue, and it's usually white, so it's a Pensman digitalis. Um, this is bee balm or horse mint, Monarda bread buriana, and it um, will also, it has another Monarda that will bloom later in the year. It's a brighter color and it's taller. It's a, it's a more like a bright, purple or something. This is um, earlier in the year. It maybe is only 12 to 14 inches tall. Um, and again, it likes poor soil. This is a type of milkweed. Missouri actually has 14 uh, native milkweeds. This is called world milkweed. And that's kind of because the flowers kind of go around the stem. And it, I like it because it's a very fine foliage. So it gives a little different type leaf than, than many of the other milkweeds that you see that have much broader leaves. This is the spider milkweed. Um, this is one of the earliest ones to bloom for the monarchs going uh, north. And here's the common milkweed. This is one of the um, favorites of monarch butterflies and uh, they will lay their eggs. And then as the eggs hatch and the caterpillars come out, they eat these leaves. And that's why it's the only plant that they, I mean, um, milkweeds are the only plants that monarchs will lay their eggs on because um, the caterpillars have to eat monarch leaves. Part of the reason for that, it's a defense thing because um, milkweeds taste terrible. Um, they have a, um, it's like a latex sappy looking stuff in it. And 
um, it must make the caterpillars taste very bad. So a bird might try to eat one once and then the bird will know, I don't want that caterpillar. So um, they will leave them be. Um, and different milkweeds have different um, amounts of this substance that makes it taste bad and is poisonous. So um, this one must have a fairly high amount of that in it because this is really a preferred plant. This is the orange butterfly weed that everybody likes, the Sclepias tuberosa. Um, depending upon your, in your garden, you can probably grow this pretty easily. Um, my plant wound up being about three feet around um, after a few years. Um, but all of a sudden the last two years, well, we have not had any pods, seed pods for me. And I don't quite know why. And it's not just, uh, it wasn't just me, other people who live around me had the same issue. So I don't know if it was our weather or what. This is a yellow cone flower. So as I was talking about the, the cone flowers and the, some of the real fancy ones that are the native ours, um, you, you don't have to use those. You can go to this, this one is the Paradoxa and it is yellow and it is, it has a very large bloom. It's like a purple milkweed that's, that's large. It's not a, a smaller one. Um, and I love them. Uh, this one was just growing wildly on, on my cliff at, at my house. Um, I have now started trying to really um, raise those because that's a good thing, contrast to have with your purple milkweeds or your purple coneflowers. This is the Lanceleaf coreopsis. Um, it grows very easily and it self seeds. You can kind of see the head um, above this flower on the left. And uh, as that ripens and gets dark and kind of shriveled up, that is just covered, it's just filled with seeds. This is a gorgeous one. This is called um, Shooting Star. Um, very difficult to propagate. I'm, I keep battling this and haven't had much luck. So I have to buy mine because I can't seem to get them to grow on their own. Um, but it's very delicate. It's actually, um, I think on the front of, no, it's not on the front of the Missouri Wildflower uh, book, but it's, um, I think it's in the front of the pink section. And these are just very, very um, pretty and delicate. This is ladies' tresses. This blooms much later in the year. This is like almost a September, October one. Now it, it blooms on, on the edge of my glade. So I'm not, I'm not sure how easily it would grow other, other places. Uh, it is in the orchid family. This is fire pink. So this is um, another one. We have three or four different plants that are bright red that look very similar. Uh, fire pink is one. Um, the cardinal flower, which is in the lobelia family that likes water, is another one. And then there's uh, royal catchfly, which is also red. So those are, um, if you have enough room in your garden, you could plant some native grasses. Um, cedar sedge is going to be relatively low. Oak sedge is going to be relatively low and clumping. Little blue stem is getting a little bit taller. You want to make sure you get the little blue stem and not the, the large blue stem because that's um, very tall, very, very tall. Side oak scramma is a, another one that's nice to have in your yard. Some of the native vines are the American bittersweet and you have to make sure that you are getting something that is labeled as native because there's an oriental bittersweet that is getting very invasive in Missouri and you don't wanna plant that. I have been in my house 25 years and I am still trying to kill the, or the oriental bittersweet that the prior owners planted. Um, there's also cross vine and something called Dutchman's pipe. And the old fashioned dust, Dutchman's pipe that kind of curves down and then up. Um, 
that is actually what their flowers look like. And it is a host plant for the pipe, um, pipe vine swallowtail. So that's a, a good a good one to have. And you will notice that it will get eaten. The leaves will get eaten up. But if you go up carefully and you lift a leaf, you may find a whole bunch of the caterpillars underneath. So some of the native shrubs and trees that you might want to incorporate, depending upon how much um, of a garden you have, American beauty berry. And that has just gorgeous um, kind of crimsony purple uh, berries and it's, it just gets loaded in the fall. Um, button bush is a, a nice one. Nine bark. For the larger trees, you have pawpaw. Some people love to eat pawpaws. I'm not terribly fond of the flavor of the fruit. Um, persimmon trees, again, they get very tall and you're lucky if you can get any fruit because usually the deer eat up as far as they can reach. And so then you have to wait for the ones taller up to, to drop to the ground and you have to try to get it before they get them. Uh, oaks, obviously we have many, many native oaks and I like um, vernal witch hazel because it will bloom in um, like February, January and February. So if you're out in the woods and you see something with these um, fairly small um, yellow flowers, it's, and it's a tree that might be a witch hazel. Uh, this was just showing you, this is one of the milkweeds you could plant. You can see it's kind of a, it kind of groups itself versus being, um, very tall and lanky. So that's why this one isn't bad for a garden. Um, that's a deciduous holly, and you can see the wonderful uh, berries that it gets on it. Um, and that's all I have if you have any questions that have come up. Does anybody have any questions for Liz? Or comments, please put them into the chat box or write a comment on Facebook, let us know. And I'm gonna hold up a couple books that are very excellent. And um, this is one that you can get at the Missouri Department of Conservation. And I will be sending Rennie a, uh, a list of um, sources of information on native plants that I have found very helpful. Um, here's another one, native landscaping. And uh, that's also available from the conservation, Missouri Department of Conservation. And this as you're really learning about native plants is the one that you'll, you'll find yourself carrying around. Um, this has been around a long time. Um, this happens, the one that I happen to grab is the sixth edition, but I think they have one since then. Just checking for some comments. I'm not seeing anything popping up. Okay. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a um, world that will open to you if you get interested in native plants. Um, and just again, note when you are outside and maybe in a park, or maybe if there are some gardens in in some of the towns and cities that um, gardeners have kind of taken over and take care of and maintain, they may well have quite a few native plants. Mm. Once they are established, they're fairly easy to maintain. Um, sometimes you want to deadhead them if they're dropping so many seeds that you're getting them all over, but you don't really like to cut the stalks down in the fall like we're used to doing. We're used to cutting the stalks down and cleaning up the leaf litter. And um, some of those stems are hollow and that's where some of our bees and other insects overwinter. They actually uh, go down in the hollow stems. Well, I know I've learned a lot of new things tonight. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you did. And hopefully people will take uh, an interest and in, in just see what's out there. And as I said, this is a good time to hike. 
especially um, since we've all been locked down due to COVID. It's very nice to be able to get out in nature and just see what's, what's out and about. For sure. Well, we want to thank you very much for giving us a presentation on the native fl uh, flowers and plants of Missouri. I think it was really um, very informative and we'll probably end up having it up on our YouTube channel if that's okay. We have a okay. recording. So that will that's be fine. up and available um, at some point. So thank you again very much. We really appreciate it. And tune in on Thursday at five o'clock for another adult program. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.